Welcome back to the 1010s Podcast. My name is, of course, Michael Beck with Adam and Handsome Rob. Now we're back to Handsome. Thanks. And uh, this Who week, we have guests with us. We have Luke Stilly. Did Got I get it. that right? Got it. Yes. Wow. Oh, man. For once, I get a name right. And Matthew Hines. <laughs> yep. And uh, you guys are from uh, Angle Junkies. Yep. And uh, for those that can't put that together, they uh, they do drift things, more the, or less. They're our local drift crew. So are you guys from Des Moines then, actually? You both live in Des Moines? or We yeah. are. Okay. We actually, both. Yeah, here from Waukee. Um, so you guys have a couple of pretty interesting cars, which we've spent the afternoon hanging out with and taking pictures of. Um, Luke, why don't you start with your car? Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, my car is actually a 2004 Pontiac GTO, which is quite rare in the drift community. Uh, I actually bought the car for the drivetrain to put into a S13 240SX, drove the car at an event once and fell in love with it and have basically been using it ever since. So you told me when we were screwing around taking pictures, you actually bought that car, it was flooded? It was salvaged? It was, was it? Uh, the story I got was the nephew of the owner put it into a creek basically and totaled the car, which I did not know when I bought it, Ooh. but hey, it worked out. Oh, you didn't know it was a totaled car? I didn't know it had been in a creek underwater, but everything works and functions as it should, so I locked out there. Blood damage cars can be a real problem. Yeah, Very tricky to find. They're a pain in the nightmare. ass from prior experiences. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, last GTO. the last GTO I had was a prior flood damage car. And it so had the, you've had two flood damage GTOs. Yeah, the first one I knew was a flood car. It had water on the carpet, and I think it was a little higher than that. And then this one I bought basically is a Craigslist find. He found it and sent it to me, and, yeah, I couldn't get the guy to email me back, and then he uh, emailed Luke back, and it was literally we went to a, get it. a guy had to go to his barn to get on the Internet to reply to emails. <laughs> so it took like four or five tries to get a hold of him, and we, it was out in BFE, western Iowa somewhere. We just pulled it out of his yard between a bunch of other wrecked cars and loaded on the Off trailer went. and went home. Right. Said basically, if it starts and drives onto the trailer, I'll take it. And it did. So the rest is history. So that car, so you, you talked about you've got another car. So talk about your other car as well. Uh, my other car is a 93 <laughs> Nissan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what year it is. I think it's a 93 uh, 240SX. It's a hatch. Uh, it's actually got the now original drivetrain to my GTO in it. It's a, you know, just a stock LS1 with the T56 behind it. So that's the that's the 57 LS1 then. Yep. Okay. It is. Um, cuz the GTO then. It's got a iron block 6 liter LQ9 out of uh, Cadillac Escalade. So it's a a little bit stronger when you add boost for future future references. For future use. Are you going to do that this year or are you just going to leave it stock? I'd like to do some forced induction hopefully this winter. Um, we'll see if that actually happens or not. If I decide to buy a boat or some other <laughs> aquatic adventuring <laughs> object. Piece of machinery. Yeah. yeah. We'll see where that goes. Uh, well, I'd like to come back to that because I have some other questions about that car. Um, but Matt, talk a little bit about uh, your 240. Yeah, I've got a 1992 Nissan 240SX. Uh, I've owned the car for oh, about six or seven years now. And uh, originally, I just kind of messed around and went with the Turbo KA, which is basically the stock motor, but with the turbo on it. Uh, I went through two or three of those and then finally ditched the KA and went to an SR20, uh, which I because I'd bought a front clip from Japan, actually, and came over all just wrapped on a crate and basically half a car. And then uh, I ran the SR for uh, three years, had had no maintenance issues other than just changing the oil and spark plugs. And then, uh, finally this last year I went and, um, got rid of the SR and got a crate LS2, uh, just got a mild cam in it and T56. It's a whole nother animal. It's the way that Robbie wants to go now. It is the way I want to go after my SR20 issues. Yeah. It sounds very healthy. It's a good sounding car. It is healthy, yes. <laughs> I think you probably have the same issues I had with SR20s that I could never, ever figure them out. Right. But Matt over here had the best running SR I've ever seen in my life. And I, yeah. I don't get it. Did yeah. you? So you put that motor in that car then, the SR20? Yeah. What did it have for an ECU then? Um, it was tuned on an Apexi Power FC. 
See, isn't that what the guy from BC told you to put in your car? He said that or a mega squirt. That, yeah. That and then the guy from uh, South Des Moines, he was running the same thing. He said he had a great load. I said what the engine was running on last year. Then was I, was the Apexy? Yeah. So then I went to AEM and I've, been, I've had nothing but <laughs> so issues. So you completely ignored everybody's advice? <laughs> well, I, I had, a, that's I had what AEM he had to begin with. I had that right. before. Right. That's what they talked me into four years ago. Right. At least. But that solved your problem the first go round. Yes. Because you had, you had ECU, ECM issues before that as well. Yeah, but I had a stock like ECU when I one. did a lot of changes to it and then they did the, uh, yeah, I'll say it's at it. Where does it say? SAFC. What's that? Was it just an SAFC that they put on originally? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then it's at, at excessive and they couldn't figure out a lot of these issues and they got it running on an AEM and they were a distributor at the time. They weren't running anything else. And then now mm-hmm. that's the one thing they don't really do. Yeah. Well, they, no. do, they do that, but like they're, they're pushing for others like Haltech and uh, Mega Squirt. Pro EFI is their, is their big yeah preferred brand right now. Yep. So I guess talk to us a little bit about how you guys got into drifting. Cause I think in the Midwest anyway, since we don't have much in the way of tracks other than RPM, um, or apparently the track in Cedar Rapids, which has decided they're going to do a drift exhibition in August, we yeah. found out. Um, yeah, I think that there's some limited opportunities for people to do drifting if that's what they want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so how did you guys get into it? Um, I think we both just kind of, I don't know, we were young and we wanted to kind of do something with cars. So we started out doing autocrossing. And then our biggest issue was that with that was just the wait times around here. Mm-hmm. Cause there is a lot of autocrossing to do, but the thing is, it's like, it's the only thing that you can really do around here. So, right. you know, you'd be out there for six hours out of the day and you'd only go home with 10, 15 minutes of drive time. So then we just kind of started dabbling in the whole idea of doing drifting. And then as soon as one of our friends bought a 240SX, we went out and just sliding it around. And next thing you know, we were all hooked and we we're all buying Nissans and whatever else, rear wheel drive cars. It was a downhill slope. Downhill slope from there. But it's a very steep downhill slope too. Yeah, especially on the bank account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a savings account once. <laughs> the whole the whole time we're driving around, you know, to get the pictures, I'm with Luke. He's like, Why don't you just come out and why don't you just ride along? Just ride along. Just just once. Just check it out. See what you think. I see where this is going. <laughs> it's one of those, it's like a club where you're trying to just drag everybody down with you. Like, yeah. jo- join, it's a great time, but you're going to be completely broke. So just come we join all us. broke you, together. You have a great car for it. I Michael. do have a great car for it. I, that's what I was talking to Luke about. I've got the RX-7. It's already got the V8 in it. It's got the six-speed. Just go right for it. Just, just some, some mild suspension changes. The great you're part, ready to go. The great part is the stuff that is a problem right now, I don't have to fix. Like the hood clearance issue. You just cut a hole. You just cut a hole in the hood. Or not Ooh, run the hood. Just take it off. Just yeah. take the hood off. Yeah, I probably <laughs> won't even run the hood. It's overrated. <laughs> I bet it's real easy on rear axles too. Some should be fine. I mean, you're not you're not gripping like like a drag racing event, so you'll be fine. You won't twist an axle, right? Because that's what I was worried about doing. If I ever did a prep event, is that I'll probably break an axle because axles are not rated for you know real hard launches <laughs> like that. Mm-hmm. People worry about them on uh, road courses sometimes because you can you can bind them up and and twist them, but. They're only good for about 300 horsepower, which is about what I'll have. But it should be fine. We'll figure it out. But I, I, I think in, in drifting, that'll be actually a pretty good setup. Um, you know, my thing when it comes to drifting is I worry about expendable parts, you know, especially tires. Have you guys mainly run takeoffs? Or are you guys running newer tires? Or what, what are you guys doing? Uh, I run a mix of tires. You know, sometimes I'll get the right size tire from work as a takeoff. Um, and then sometimes when we go to bigger events, we'll run like a federal five, nine, five. Okay. Uh, basically drift spec tire. See, that's what I was planning on running. Cause they're only like yeah. 75 bucks. They're a pretty piece. cheap. Yeah. And they last a long time. Do they? For what we're basically doing. I've heard people say they're not, they're really a pretty good tire yeah, for they, that type of event. They really are. Yeah. That's what I've been running for the last two years was the, uh, federal five, nine fives. But um, ever since I went to LS, I've just been buying brand new tires. I uh, started using the Kenda KR20s and uh, kind of mixed feelings on them right now. I might go back to the Federals. That's a brand I'd never even heard of when you said it when we were talking earlier. It's mm-hmm. not a brand I'm familiar with at all. Um, do they market mainly to people who are drifting? or? Um, you know, it's hard to say. I just know a lot of – they seem to be pretty popular with a lot of the guys from Minnesota – 
I know a lot of those guys run that tire and they seem to like them. So I figured I'd give them a shot. Are they priced similar to the federal or? Yeah, they're pretty close in price. It's just, I was trying to go with a little bit bigger size tire and uh, federal didn't make it in the five, nine, five and Kenda did. So what are you running for a tire size? I'm just running a two twenty five forty seventeen. You running that square then all yeah. the way around the car. Okay. Yeah. I usually, uh, I'll put the new set on the front so they heat cycle while the rears are getting burned off. Yeah. Otherwise they're, they're pretty inconsistent if you just throw a brand new tire on the back. But if you heat cycle them through the front and then put your new set on the front and then put the old ones on the back and burn them off. It seems to work out well. Yeah. It seems to be more consistent. Can you do a couple of events on, on a set of tires then or, or no. is that just a, a day <laughs> yeah. usually? I, right now I've been going through like maybe two pairs, you know, in the, in the day. So, so basically a full set then. Yeah. Four, basically four a full set yeah. of tires. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was looking at the federals. I think they make like a 215 and a 235 and then a 255. Why did you choose to go with the 225? It seems like some of the guys that have the higher horsepower cars will run a wider tire than that, yeah. but... Uh, basically, right now, I'm just limited by the wheel size that I have and how big of a tire I could fit under the, the quarter panel because my car's still on the stock quarter panels. Right. Uh, if I went put some wide body you know, fender flares or something like that on it, I could definitely go run a bigger tire. Run a bigger tire. Yeah. Does that, I mean, how does that affect the car then when you start running a, a wider tire? Do you have better entry speed or what's that no, do for you? Basically, it's all just going to be about grip. Uh, usually with a wider tire, you're going to be able to put more grip down, essentially go around the track faster. Um, but you can achieve a lot of that too, just based off of you know, what kind of tire you're running as opposed to running a new versus a takeoff tire, as well as, uh, you know, lowering your tire pressure. So if you're running, you know, 35 pounds, you're going to burn through them a lot quicker than if you were to drop the same tire down to 20. Sure. So, so I guess for the people that don't know, when it comes to a drift event, like say, you know, kind of the exhibition type events that we would have around here at RPM, what are those guys looking for? That's that's not a competitive event, is it? That's more just to have fun? Yeah, the O-Drift Collective events are just basically hang out with your friends, have fun, go drift, do whatever. Um, it's more of a laid-back, fun atmosphere compared to a, uh, a judged event, I guess you could say. Because really, drifting, you can't... I mean, it, it's not timed like a normal road course event would be, which is very right. objective as to who the winner is and who's coming second, who's coming third. The issue with drifting is that it's, it's an objective event. So you have to have judges and, you know, they're looking for, I'm sure you guys could tell us what they're looking for. They're looking for smoke, you know, speed. I mean, what exactly do they look for when it comes to marking people? Uh, a lot of it's, it starts with entry speed. Um, definitely the higher entry speeds you have into the first corner, the better. Um, and then they're going to look at your line based on how close and in how you set up to the clipping points Usually there's like three corners, three to four corners, and then there's going to be a usually an inner or an outer clip, and uh, it's either going to be obviously on the inside or the outside part of the track. And the clip uh, point is just the edge of the edge of the circuit. Yeah, it's on the they usually mark it with a cone. You know, oh, okay. And if it's an inner clip point, they want to see how close you can get your front bumper to it without touching it. I gotcha. And then uh, just based on the line that you put down, and also how much angle you can throw at it. Uh, and a lot of that's based off your power as far as how much angle you can hold. Um, and then as far as the, that's basically the lead guy. And then the chase guy, his objective is to basically mirror the, the lead car. You want to put down the same line and, um, it's all about proximity with the chase car. You just want to see how close you can get to the guy in front of you, obviously without actually hitting him. That's so crazy. I just oh man, got to scare the crap wrong. out of me. So just go against everything that you've ever yes, thought about exactly. as far as motorsports go. Everything I, it's it's everything I don't want to do. It's because <laughs> like Luke, your car's got a big ding in the side because somebody didn't hold his tandem drift and basically plowed into the side of your GTO. That you were the yeah. you were the chase car. Yeah, right? I was the chase car, and we were trying to do something that was probably. Not a good idea, but we did it anyway, and I ended up being the recipient of some of the damage, and his car was 
probably worse than mine. Oh yeah, it was way worse. It was. Uh, <laughs> but you got towed off. Yeah, so. I actually got uh, got the wrecker, and he drove away. But I, his quarter panel was mangled, and his brand new tail light was in pieces. So I kind of felt bad, but it's part of the sport. What did you break on your car? Uh, I broke the knuckle, basically the where it was custom welded to make it so you get more angle in the corners. It broke right at the weld. Um, not putting any fault on anybody because I actually broke his wheel with my wheel and the weak link was his wheel and my knuckle. So, <laughs> so I can't be too mad. Fair enough. Something's got to give. And now I have a nice battle scar on my door. Did you replace that front fender then or? It didn't touch the front fender. It somehow took out my knuckle and the door. So it <laughs> magically hit it in two spots for some reason. Fender. Huh? Yeah, that's your, pretty sweet. Your car's interesting because you were telling me that it's got it's got an S14 wide body kit on it. We're talking about the it's GTO got here too. A bunch of different aero parts from a lot See, of I mentioned that to you. Yeah, I was, I was Robbie like, was looking at it. He's like, this doesn't look like he looks this looks like he cut it out of other cars and made it. Yeah, so the front fenders are from a S14 Kuki um, that I cut down and trimmed to fit. The side skirts are lengthened S13 side skirts and then the rear over fenders are off an S13 hatch also that were basically cut down, lengthened in some spots, cut apart in other spots, and basically remolded to fit. Because no one makes aero parts for a GTO, obviously. <laughs> what about that like rear piece? I don't uh, the rear diffuser is off a, for a Z33 350Z, and then the <laughs> the hood hood uh, uh, extractor is f uh, just like a generic piece that you can buy from. I think 9K Racing is where I got it from. Doesn't it have a GTR lip or something on it too? And then it's got a Ford Mustang <laughs> RTR lip. So it's got parts. <laughs> it's got parts from everything on it. It, it looks. It looks great. It looks yeah, mean. It looks though. Great. I that, love it. Last time, so a year ago when I saw that car, you said it was silver, which yeah, it makes because like I didn't put that together when we were at. Uh, that would have been an Altoona at Adventureland. Yep. He was there. I didn't put together that that was the same car. It was. It was stock bodied then. It didn't have any of the fancy. But it's got a stuff. it's got a custom cage in it though. Yep, uh, we have a a really good cage builder here, actually in Central Iowa that has done I don't know how many cages. I think everybody from Illinois to Minnesota to Iowa to Nebraska to everywhere. And it, Let's plug him a little bit. Who is it? Uh, his name is uh, Travis from Xiaomi Garage. He does excellent work. It's. I've seen, I follow him on Facebook. He's got a show me garage page and, uh, we have a couple of friends that know him pretty well. And, uh, it just blows my mind how beautiful the stuff he makes is. It's really, really nice. Yeah. And he definitely knows what he's doing because, uh, he's been building, uh, dirt track chassis for quite a while now. Doesn't he work for Carl's? Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, works in their shop over in Ankeny. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the main things is in drifting, they don't let you, most events that you go to, they won't let you run multiple cars unless you have a cage. And that's one of the things that kind of drives me nuts is when people show up with their cages that their friend who took a welding class in high school put in their, their car, you know, some, mm -hmm. some are that's, scary. That's like the biggest safety concern. And it's like people just, a lot of people don't take it seriously. And it's like, well, Travis, he knows what he's doing. And that's your life behind that cage. Right. And so, you you know, you definitely need to make sure that that's, that's one of the things where you spend the money and get it done right on your car. And Travis can definitely do that. Safety parts are something people slack on. I never understood why. Like, yeah, come on. <laughs> they just try to rig it how they can just to get through tech. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you do have an accident, then uh, you definitely want to make sure you're safe because there's yeah. two people in drifting, those that have crashed or had an accident and then those that are going to yeah it's, <laughs> it's, it's going to happen there's no way around it Cause, yeah because uh matt you had an accident recently didn't you it actually was three years ago oh okay believe. so it was a little while ago then yeah it was it was one of my first uh first real events i guess with my car and uh basically i had entered a corner you know i was coming in really hot and entered at way too high of a speed overshot the corner and ended up in the K barriers at about oh, 35 or 40 miles an hour. 
something like that. And watered the car up pretty good. But uh, once we got it back, we put on a frame rack and made sure everything was still in spec. And at that point, I still wasn't ready to go with the wide body or anything like that. So I we just put a new stock quarter panel and rocker on it. And after that, I decided that it was time for a cage. And that's when I went to Travis and he uh, he hooked that up and as well as a tube front. So, see, Robbie, you could run your car. It's bent to shit. It is bent to shit. It's nowhere deal. close to true. His yeah. is probably more true than yours. I would guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> it was on a rack, so we his, made sure it was close. His car. So your front, your whole front. Uh, yeah, the front the, K member was. Yep, the K member is supposed to be bolted in place. Mine yeah. was welded in place, and they're not even close to the right holes. Like I was trying to put a bash plate under there the other day, and I was like, oh, I just got to take off six bolts and put you know put six in. We're good. No, it's all welded, and it's all askew. Oh, Luke's so I, had a couple of those kinds of cars. Yeah, I've had <laughs> that GTO is actually quite bent on the right front. The the frame rail actually sits about an inch or two f- up from the left frame rail. You mean higher up, like yeah, taller so like than the other one? The, the K member I bought, I actually had to weld like an inch spacer on the bottom of it, <laughs> so it'd sit flush. That car is quite bent, but I mean it's it's a fun car to drive and. It does all right. So, well, considering what you're doing with it, you don't want it to be perfect. Yeah, so. it's just right. going to get wrecked again. So, right. Mm-hmm. So, tell us a little bit about your other car because we started to talk about that and then we moved past it. The S13. Yeah. So, what are you planning on doing with that car now? It's got the LS1 in it. Uh, I don't know. I drove it once. Did you Did you buy the You bought the S13, assuming that was going to be your 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 drift car, and then. You ended yeah, up the GTO, yeah, that's right? been a perpetual project for probably four years, and I never got the ambition to really finish it because I never had a drivetrain in mind to put in it. Like it was going to be a SR20, and then it was going to be an RV25, and then I bought the GTO to you know put the LS1 in it, and then I started drifting the GTO, so the 240 just kind of went back into the back burner again, and then finally put the LS1 in it, and now I don't drive it. Is it to get? I mean, does it drive? It, yeah, it's it runs, drives, and everything. So is it more like a street-oriented car then? No, it's even more stripped down than the GTO. It's oh, on really? par with what Matt's yeah, car is. Yeah, it's pretty similar to mine. I mean, no heater box, no anything that isn't needed. I mean, the it's got a dash sitting in it basically, and that's it. Is it a nice looking car, or could you? Yeah, yeah could it's you, a, you know, it's got real paint on it. And it's a nice blue. I don't even remember what color I painted it anymore. It's actually a really clean. But it's a uh, yeah. It came from South Carolina, and it's a it's a rust free body. So so you wouldn't want to turn it into a quote drift missile then, and and thrash it and beat the shit out of it. Uh, I mean, I still do that, but I try to <laughs> keep it clean. Try to uh, keep it out of the wall. We we try to keep our cars pretty clean. We don't go out there trying to run into things, but things happen, and but we fix it. So right, sure. So talk a little bit about, I mean, Robbie and I were pretty drunk on our experience at Grid Life, thinking that, you know, drifting is probably something we want to try. Yeah, that we need to do. I haven't talked Robbie into, he's got, I don't know if you noticed, he's got a molded, basically an entire molded body kit on his car. Okay. It started out as a show car build, so, so it's, it's kind of evolved into a race car. It's a hot in Port Knights car, huh? Absolutely. It is. That's, That's exactly, exactly what it, what it was built for, quite <laughs> literally. So his bumpers don't come off. No. It's not an option. The side skirts don't come off. It's not an option. Uh, so I haven't quite talked him into forcibly ripping them off. Not cutting those off. Not going to happen. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't have to cut them off. You just have to let the track take them off. Yeah, one or drift of them will come track. off. Yeah. <laughs> Your <laughs> off-track yeah. excursion. I would rather buy a whole other car. Okay, fair enough. So for somebody like me who has a car that was going to be a track build car that now I'm starting to think about drifting, I mean, what is somebody in my position... Once the car's complete, I mean, what should I think about doing? Do I want to think about just taking the car out as it is? Do I want to change something on it? Um, do I just need to get out there and try not to run into a wall? I mean, what what should I do? I think the best place to start with any drifting is uh, not necessarily with the drivetrain and the power. I mean, if you have it, it's nice. But it's all about, um, I don't know, like if you're a lower-powered car, having a welded diff helps out quite a bit. Um Coil and then, uh, yeah, good suspension setup, some good coilovers, um, just adjustable arms. It's basically about learning the car and what it wants to do and its tendencies before you go and add power. Because I've seen plenty of people that have started with power and hadn't really 
drifted before and it's just I don't want to say a disaster, but a disaster. It's too much. <laughs> yeah. I it's mean, too much to try to learn. They try to level. drive with the throttle instead of trying to drive the car. I think this is very similar to what we've talked about before in autocross or road racing, where it's better to start with a low powered car and get it figured out and then add power as you go. Yeah, I think your technique is better. At least I can only speak from autocross and road racing. Your technique is better if you start with a lower horsepower car because, you know, breaking too much, losing momentum, having to regain it, you're hugely penalized for those things Mm -hmm. in autocross and in road racing if you have a low-powered car. So you're constantly thinking about what's my line, where do I need to be, where do I need to be braking, where do I need to be back on the accelerator. Those are critical items because otherwise you're just going to get left in the dust. So from a, a drifting perspective, it sounds like there's some carryover there where you can learn some good techniques on a car that doesn't make much power as long as it's you know got a you know a solid or not a solid rear end but a welded diff or an LSD on it. Um, it so what I mean for a beginner, what are some of the techniques that they're going to need to pick up to be able to do it? Um, I would say basically start by. Um, just doing those few modifications and then really kind of getting out there and then just learning how the car handles. Um, basically if you're a lower powered car to start out with, you're, you're going to want to basically leave the pedal to the floor and then uh, use a clutch clutch kick kick in a lot. Uh, E-brake is that as popular as it's made out to be, or is that that not used as much as the average person thinks? I noticed you both have hydraulic e-brakes. Yeah, it depends on who you ask. Um, I think it's necessary if you're going to run close tandems. Um, you don't necessarily need it for initiating corners. Um, I mean, it kind of it's nice to have if you're going to come into a corner too close. You can extend the drift. Um, but mainly, I use it for proximity when running tandem. Yeah, for uh, for a beginner going and drifting that hasn't really done it before, I would stay away from the handbrake at all. And basically use a, a flick, um, basically counter steer the car to get it. We know it is the Scandinavian flick. But yes, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Because so, a handbrake, if you do like a handbrake on a like a stock KA 150 horsepower car, it'll actually scrub speed when you're at that power level and you'll lose so much momentum that you'll actually it'll probably straighten you out. Gotcha. Whereas where if you go into this corner at top of third gear is hard as you can and you basically flick the car and clutch kick it it'll carry you through the corner much easier i think and that's a common misconception because i think everybody who doesn't do it just thinks oh i just drive as fast as i can at a corner yank the e-brake throw the steering wheel and drift yeah and, and it's it's not that at all and, and anybody thinks who thinks that you don't need a hydraulic handbrake period you know ever uh i have to disagree with them there because i don't think that you can really run well, I mean, I guess just a handbrake in general. You can't really run extremely close tandem unless you have one. Cause exactly. You got to have a way to kind of back off of off the chase or off the lead car. So, when did you guys start doing that? Because that to me would make me super nervous. I really have this thing in my. I've got a mental block where I really don't want to run into anybody ever. <laughs> and so, I it, never actually really used a handbrake until we went to. Uh, Shawano, Shawano, Wisconsin. Shawano. Okay. It's a little go kart track up there north of Green Bay. Okay, and I learned more about hand braking in two days than I ever care to remember. Uh, that course is very good for learning techniques of basically how to use a handbrake to slow you down to uh, lengthen a corner or how long you slide into a corner and proximity with other cars you learn a lot even if even though it was you know a top of second gear course you learn a lot about that kind of technique yeah first that track can be a little intimidating if you you know if you're not too familiar with drifting but i think once you have the basics down a trip to us air is a must because you know it's once you have the basic concept of drifting down and you you know you you kind of have the parking lots mastered you can you can really learn a lot there to, to really progress because it's still a low speed course. It's a lot of second gear stuff, but it's pretty technical. So you, uh, you can work on your positioning a lot and that kind of stuff as opposed to, you know, if you go to a bigger road course and you know, you're going 70 to 80 mile an hour entry speeds, that can be pretty intimidating. Sure. 
How how long of a track is that go kart track? Do you remember? Less than a mile. Uh, oh yeah, it's a uh, basically a bunch of corners joined together in like a Lego block. I mean, it's not one straight shot. It's oh, all it sorts all, of it's all kind of, kind of corners. Yeah, I yeah, mean, it's whole, all. The corners, a lot of them are elevated and banked too. No, oh, really. So they call it the <laughs> roller coaster of love. There's one spot if you hit it just right, you'll actually get your front tires airborne. And if oh, anybody God. spun out on the other side of that corner, you're bound to hit them. I was trying to compare it to Marshalltown, but it sounds scarier. I was going to say, have you guys ever been it's, to the Marshalltown Kart Track? I like uh, even uh, your auto no. crossing days. No, I never made it that far. Okay, I think because that's about a half a mile in length, and I'm. Actually, kind of surprised you couldn't. I don't know that you could tandem there because it's a really narrow track. I don't even know that you could really drift there very well. You couldn't get a ton of angle on that place no, because not. it's really narrow. Yeah, and I think if you hit a curb, it'd be a really bad day. If yeah, you were there's there's this railroad track issue as well. Yeah, there's a train that runs right by it. It's not <laughs> ideal. We've oh, had yeah. we've had arc or we've had people end up on the train track in, in our cars. I can't imagine how it would go because that's the well, fastest corner there, so you know they're going to be throwing at them. Yeah, We've there seen was, some cars go through the fence at US Air. Well, uh, that or Marshalltown will be no longer in September, so oh, I guess that's, uh, that's over. Yeah, they sold so, it. Oh, yeah, man. Alliant Energy bought it apparently. Cause yeah, they, it's going to be coming into a training facility. Oh, Lineman's just, training yeah. facility. So at these events, are, do you guys get people that are like, coaching or do you guys just kind of show up and go well here you go figure it out <laughs> well yeah um i mean when we first started drifting what, in 2012 i want to say uh we were new we didn't really have any idea what we were really doing and uh you know you'd go do a run or try to do a run i spun out a lot in my early years because i wasn't good and uh you know, you'd have people come up to you and say, you know, try doing this instead of this. Or they, you know, some people would hop in your car like, hey, can I ride with you and show you some things? And those people really help out. Like, you know, this is what I do in this corner. It's not necessarily the right thing, but it, it has helped me, you know, smooth the transition or get around the corner better. Or if you mm-hmm. hit, try to hit that that block, it'll send you around the corner this much easier. So I wouldn't say there's any teachers but there's people that are willing to help along the way yeah basically just find somebody that that you think is doing well and um, the drifting community is so nice that you know everybody's willing to help you out you know if you if you have a question on your setup or if you're having a lot of trouble on a certain corner just just ask somebody and you know they'll they'll help you in fact they'll you know they'll be more than happy to help you it's it's interesting the way you approach getting into this and learning it is very different than anything else I've done. I guess autocross in some ways is like this where you just, you just got to get out there and do it. And a lot of times if you ask for help, people will give it to you. But you know, usually you talk about road course racing. It's very heavily regulated. Mm -hmm. You know, the rules are very strict. There's, you know, you can pay a lot of money to have somebody teach you how to do it. But, uh, it seems a little bit more, um, you know, I don't know, free, grassroots. grassroots, free range when it comes to drifting. So I think my mind is a little bit caught up on that because it's like, well, who, you know, where do I go? Who, who do I give money to, to, to teach me how to do this? Well, but, you said, uh, you mentioned, Michael, that at least the O Drift Collective event, the entry fee is extremely reasonable. Yeah, it's it's a lot cheaper than a regular road course event. Like a track day at a, the same track. A real track day, yeah. It's, you know, a third the cost, half the cost. I mean, obviously, you're going to have wear on a, on a road course if, if you're doing a track day, obviously. You're yeah, gonna I have think the wear. consumable price on drifting is still higher. It's Yeah, it's probably still higher. So, you know, it, it may equal out at the end, but I was interested to see that the entry fee seemed very reasonable because I'm used to seeing, oh, it's a track day. Just expect to throw down at least $300 just to get through the gate. Yeah, and with us, it's the entry fees. You know, one of the the lowest parts. You know, we definitely make up for it if if you're running new tires and right. that kind of stuff or breaking things. But at the same time, our tires are considerably less than buying Hoosier racing slicks or at, yeah, anything absolutely. like yeah, that. Absolutely. So. Yeah. So, at an event, do you guys have like what's a normal size like for an O Drift Collective at, at Mayhem? What's a normal car count? Do you guys get 40 cars, 100 cars. 
I would say cars. It, it varies, but um, I'd say at the O Drift events, I bet, I'd guess around 40, 40 to 50 cars. Um, but if you go up to, you know, a track like US Air up in Wisconsin, they, they sell out and they yeah. cap at like 100 drivers or something like that. So, it so varies. even at like the local O Drift collective, they're getting as many or more than we get at an average autocross. Yeah. And we're asking people to drive 10 minutes across town. Yeah. To get and there. they, they oftentimes won't do that. So, yeah, that's the, if there was one downfall of drifting, it's the travel, at least for people from our location, because we're traveling the nearest tracks, you know, almost two hours away. Right. And before that it was Topeka, Kansas, and it would be a four hour trip just to go drifting. And then other than that, it was eight to 10 hours of travel time just to go to, a, to an event. We did host an event one year. Oh, it had been four years ago. We did it at the Iowa Speedway skid pad, just their parking lot. And there was a good turnout. So I think if we were to do something again, you know, there there would definitely be a good turnout. Not only people driving, but people coming to spectate. Sure. You're not going to do it at that parking lot anymore. No, oh, I'm sure it's trashed now. It's junk. They we got, don't, they we got don't the, race there as, as an autocross group anymore because it's too rough. It's too many holes. Yeah, even it, when it that. was there, the first corner that we had set up, I think, you know, a some dip of the, or a yeah. something in the way. Yeah, they apparently got the cheapest contractor they could find to pour that parking lot because it's not that old. No, it shouldn't fall apart like that. No, no I know they've done autocross on it, but come on, we're not that hard on. It doesn't get stuff. used. Huh. How, how often are people in that parking lot? Once a month? Is is it even Maybe. that? Is there it one big event a month there? Maybe. I don't even know that it's definitely that. not in the winter time. It just sits there. Yeah, there's empty. Five, maybe six big events a year there. And that's the other issue with autocross too, is that we're running out of places to to do it. You know, maybe maybe you could do a drift event at, at uh, Oskaloosa. I don't know if that's going to be wide enough, but well, so um, my friend or I have a friend who who is pretty high up in the Sioux Falls autocross group, and they just got a new venue this year. Uh, they've always raced at the same venue for many many years, and they had to get a second one because of scheduling conflicts. And there's a a small drift scene up there in South Dakota, mm-hmm. and yep. somebody like came on there like, "Oh, how'd you guys get that venue? Can we have their information?" And they're like, "Uh, no, I don't think so," because they helped them hold an event somewhere else at some point in time, and I don't know that they had told the or that they were straightforward with the people who owned the venue with how much rubber was going to be laid down. <laughs> oh yeah. And they just about lost their the autocross group just about lost their ability to be there as well. And so I think that might be a challenge for drifting like we do for autocrossing. You're gonna have a hard time finding someone who's open to you doing that on their lot. Yeah, a lot of people, if you own a big concrete slab or something like that, you know, or a track, a lot of people are pretty hesitant to let somebody go out there and just burn tires off on it. But, you know, as long as, like if you're on a road course, as long as you're not just sitting in one spot doing a standing burnout, you know, your tires aren't going to be any more heated than, you know, some road course car going through there. I think it's the, mainly what they're concerned with is basically melting the asphalt with standing burnouts but we don't really do stuff like that so i know there's a lot of myths and misconceptions on that side of it but from my standpoint i don't know if it's any harder on asphalt and concrete but obviously i'm not an engineer so sure i think it's more of a visual thing that they're yeah concerned yeah about. obviously it lays so. lays a, a deeper blacker stripe i think that's what yeah people it probably are. takes a little longer to to go away Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Um, well, I don't have anything else. You guys got anything? No, I'm good. I, You're good? Yeah, I guess so. I really appreciate it, guys. This has been awesome. Uh, make sure to uh, find Angle Junkies on Facebook. You guys have any other social media? Any other? Um, not that I know of. We might have an Instagram page floating around out there. but it hasn't been updated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> not in a while. Hasn't been updated in a while. No. Um, We've been slacking. But, uh, yeah, find Angle Junkies on Facebook. And uh, Luke, Matt, really appreciate it. Thanks for coming down and letting us check out your cards. It's been awesome. Yeah, thanks thanks for having us. us. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think we're going to cut over now and do the news. Robbie, what do we got for news? Oh, we got a bunch of exciting and happy topics. Tell me about the news, Robbie. Happy, happy, happy. Happy, happy, happy. So we'll start off um, with the Brexit. 
We have no idea what the automotive industry is going to do, and we're probably fucked. Adam, do you know what Brexit stands for? Uh, it's Britain exiting the EU. British exit. So uh, I am probably the most disconnected person on the planet when it comes to political things. I know what Brexit is. Perfect. Yes. Well, so the UK, the British people, voted to leave the EU, which everybody, all the analysts, all the people that get paid multiple times more money than we do a year to predict the future, more or less, and then bet money on it, got it all wrong. They thought for sure that uh, the EU or the UK would vote not to leave the EU, um, and it turns out that it passed by 52%. Yeah, and they thought it was a, like a very safe bet. We don't oh, even yeah, we'll need to fine. worry about it. Yeah. It's, this is a stupid vote. They're all going to vote to stay in. Happy donkey dory. Everything's fine. Bam, 52% said that they want to leave. And they had a they had like a record uh, voter turnout as well. I think they had yeah. high number of people that actually turned out to vote on it. And uh, also, it's worth noting that the UK includes uh, Scotland and Wales, which are not Britain. So they've so Scotland at least has tried to not be the UK a couple of times. Yep. I think it might actually pass this time so they can go back to the EU. Well, so they're still part of the the UK. So now they got to fight their battle with the UK to leave and go back to the EU. And if you look at like a voter map, you know how they, you know, all those those Ours are always red and blue. Theirs are apparently yellow and blue. I don't know, something like that, but they they showed that like all of Scotland wanted to stay. Like the whole thing voted to stay. <laughs> Usually if you look at an American map, there's always like they'll be all red and there's that one blue dot in the center of it. Yeah. Or they're all blue and there's that one red dot. No, not in Scotland. There's all one. All of Scotland United. basically wanted to stay in the EU. Uh, and then the British ruined it for them, which I'm sure they're not upset about even slightly. The funny thing was that Britain was like celebrating this as if it was like, this is our Independence Day, which is ironic because when everyone else cel- celebrates their Independence Day, it's from Britain. It's from Britain. <laughs> <laughs> but so back to why we're talking about it. The reason this might affect automotive is because a lot of major players have facilities in Britain. So I I'm not a big business guy. Like, I'm not going to be able to answer all these questions like you might be able to, Michael. But, like, from a free trade agreement, I assume this fucks things up everywhere for Britain trying to sell things to probably the EU or anywhere else. Yeah, basically. So, um, in the UK, Jaguar or Jaguar. 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 Land Rover, uh, Honda, Nissan, Ford, and Toyota all have manufacturing facilities in, I think, actually in Britain itself. Um, but uh, so currently, as well as well, it's, as it stands now and will change over the course of the next two years, um, there's a free trade agreement, as you mentioned, where it means that anybody within the EU can import export goods to anywhere else within the EU without any taxes. So under this Brexit policy now, we don't know for sure what those import or export taxes will be because they haven't been established. So basically now the UK is going to have to negotiate with every single country within the EU, of which there's like 27 or something, or 24 now. But So they're going to have to negotiate those deals. So they're going to have to go to Germany and say, okay, here's the deal. We will we'll sell you cars, basically. What are you going to charge us for an import tax? And they might say, well, we're going to charge you 10% because we want people to buy German cars. or Yeah, or 50% or 100%. Right. Like uh, trying to sell Chinese or American cars in China. Or, yeah. Like, like, isn't that crazy? Like 100% tax? It's, yeah. I, don't know, I don't know that it's 100, but it's way up there. Right. So they can, I mean, they can negotiate whatever terms they can come up with. I mean, they could say, yeah, it's 100%. You want to bring your cars in here, it's double the price because you're going to be competing directly with German manufacturers now or any other EU manufacturer for that matter. And you could potentially be taking jobs away from our citizens. So now that we're not in an alliance anymore, the the gloves are off. They can do whatever they want. Right. Which means uh, uh, places like Nissan, or Toyota, they could be like, well, it's going to be cheaper for us just to build another facility in Germany. Right. And that's that's what they're saying. I mean, everybody that, uh, you know, kind of the news outlets have talked to have said, um, they're just kind of throwing their hands up and saying, we don't know what's going to happen. But for right now, they're kind of halting all investments. And, in, you know, why would Honda invest another billion dollars in, you know, trying to improve um, their manufacturing line in the UK if in two years from now it's going to cost them, you know, a 50% import tax to send a car to France, you know, just across the the, the channel, it, it's going to be a 50% import tax. They don't know what that's going to look like. Yeah. 
So that's a big bet for those companies that are uh, in the UK. It's, if anything, it's going to be like a kind of a pause. Like everyone's just going to kind of wait. Right. And nothing's going to happen. And then, you know, we'll actually get answers here in a couple of years. But yeah. Yeah. It's hard to say. And and originally, so the it's interesting as this has come about, they've kind of talked about how the original EU agreement came about. Um, so there was an early version of the EU agreement in 1973. Um, which basically allowed for free trade of cars to, you know, within the UK or any goods, really, um, the UK and the other, what would be now the EU countries, it wasn't called the EU at the time. But the up to that point, the UK had their own, you know, manufacturing facilities for Rover and Austin and MG and those types of companies. Well, all those companies are dead now because as soon as the people in the UK could buy a German car, they bought German cars because they were so much better than the cars made in the UK. And it killed the UK automobile manufacturing industry. I don't think that's really the case anymore, though. I think the ger- or the the British manufacturers that still exist today make, on average, decent cars, or at least on par with their competitors. So well, I don't I don't know that they're. But most of what's left of British manufacturing, in fact, I think I can safely say all of what's left of. British owned British cars is niche markets. Aston, Jaguar, Range Rover, Lotus, they're niche. Well, Jaguar so, and, and Land Rover are owned by Tata, which is an Indian company. Right, but their primary manufacturing is in Britain. Correct. So I guess I should say cars whose primary manufacturing is in Britain, they're niche cars. So, so if if they had to go back to the way it was before the EU existed, where they only bought, or the majority of people only bought cars that were made in Britain, there's no commuter economy cars or anything like that that they can choose from at this point. I think that Tata is bringing in cars from India. But... Is that really a as, car you and it might be, be driving? No, uh, not really. Under the <laughs> Rover name, I think. I suppose India is probably not part of the EU, but what they're saying is that um, the EU will also have an export tax into Great Britain now. And so cars that cost this much may cost whatever that number is, 10, 15, 20, 40 percent more than they do now because the EU is charging you more to bring it in there because it's made in Germany, not Great Britain. Well, we don't, again, we don't know for sure. I mean, it could be a situation where the the UK imposes a ridiculous import tax. So if you're BMW, and BMW and Mercedes both make some normal entry-level vehicles for people um, in the EU, they tend to not bring those cars to the US. But you know, if they charge 20% even on top of those cars, they're not going to sell in the UK. So maybe what will happen is you will see a resurgence in UK manufacturing, and the UK government could use that to their advantage. The flip side of that is... Um, they may not sell cars outside of their borders anymore. So, I mean, we could see we could see some amazing things come out of this where, um, you know, that manufacturing industry in the UK blossoms. Like the resurgence of the Reliant Robin? They could, no, but <laughs> <laughs> they, they, could, they could honestly make some really cool things that we could get in the US because our trade agreement doesn't, yeah, doesn't change. Yeah, it didn't really change much for us. I think here in the US... At least from an automotive standpoint, it probably won't change much. No, because we've got import taxes. I mean, they yeah. stand the way. I mean, maybe in some actually, way they'll be in some. There's a chance that it might actually make our those cars cheaper here because we may negotiate with Britain a lower import tax than what we've had negotiated with the EU. Yeah, it's it's Who really knows? we really don't know what could happen, but it is an interesting economic issue that has happened that could have a very varied effect on the uh, automotive industry. I think I should say, let's be real, they're not going to be cheaper. Even if the importation tax is cheaper, they'll still charge us the same amount of money. They'll just pocket it instead. It's like the Chevy Volt all over again. (laughs) (laughs) What else we got, Robbie? Uh, Sweden is uh, working with electric semi-trucks. So basically the concept is I guess they built a one-mile prototype, I guess is the best way to describe it. So where a semi-truck, which has a electric 
connector, like a tram, like you would see in like Saint, uh, San Francisco or another type big city. So there's 90% of the time, the truck will be driving with a diesel or a like, gas-powered engine. And then when it gets to this highway, it'll connect up to this power grid, and it'll run 100% on electric un- well, until it disconnects. And Robbie doesn't like it. That's, I, that's not true. I think Why do you think it's dumb? Uh, be, because you, you have this flipped. It's opposite. I think it's I, a great idea. Okay. All right. Well, Adam's going to have to defend himself. Because then. first of all, it already exists. It's not nothing new. They didn't come up with anything new. They've just revamped a system that already exists, and so don't call it new. You look like you're going to argue with me. So that's isn't that like modern engineering in a nutshell? Probably. I don't know. I'm not the engineer. <laughs> you tell me, Robbie. Re, 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 repurposing or like re-engineering, polishing this up is, a new this is idea Hollywood and calling in a it nutshell. new. <laughs> well, not. I think it's a good idea because, like, say you put this electric grid on I-80, beginning to end, and you put these thousands of trucks that are on there every single day, and when they drive off of the highway, they're running diesel. When they drive onto the highway, all they have to do is connect like a bumper car, just touch electric tri- or um, you so electric- their antenna kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. your antenna t- to the other part, um, the, in engineering terms, that thing to the other bob or you yeah, know, whatever. Thanks, thanks, engineer Robbie. <laughs> You're the electrician. But it's not true. I'm not an electrician at all. You do electrical things, I, I guess. All right, but anyways, so then you run on power. You run on someone else's power grid, 100 percent of the time. You're on I-80. You're not using any so, greenhouse gases. I think it's a good idea. Well, that depends. I don't know anything about Sweden in regards to their power grid, but how do they make their power? Is it a bunch of coal-fired or diesel-fired plants? Because that's not helping. Yeah, it. it's just generators lined up along the highway. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's Sweden's so, real advanced. And they've got a lot of solar systems. They've got a lot of yeah. wind, and, and they're... They got a lot of water, so maybe they got some hydroelectric plants they're, or something. They're, I don't know. But. Maybe they're teaming up with the uh, solar panel road people. So the roads are solar, solar panels. Solar freaking roadways. That's a thing, too. I know it is. I think it's brilliant. I love it. It's a great idea. Yep. I'm, yeah, so saying it's super innovative would be a stretch, but it is a great repurposed idea. My primary problem, my primary concern with it is the overhead wires. Right. If you can put that in the ground and make it a track system. I'm more on board with it, but uh, overhead is very cost or like maintenance, high maintenance cost wise. I'm not into that. Right. Cause it's, it's literally like 18 feet off the ground. So you, all these super overloaded trucks, like the, like the John Deere combines that are going on the interstate. Oh, you're talking about the oversized loads, oversized loads, moving houses, stuff like that. That's not going to be a thing on these roads. It, it just, you can't do it. Yeah, and how else are you uh, supposed to transport that stuff? I'd right. be I'd be more into it if this was something that was underground, which we have. It's called a train. Except we ripped out all of our trains when we put know, in the highway stupid, system. Stupid, in, stupid, stupid. FDR when we put in all the highway system, we we ripped out all the train. I don't get it. Tracks, maybe except maybe. the one by my house because there's a train on it every thirty goddamn seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe they'll, maybe that'll turn instead of being semis, it'll be all electric trains, and it'll be like the railroad all over again. I don't know. I doubt it. I doubt yeah. they'll put the train tracks back. I we seem to have this weird infascin- infascination with <laughs> in infas- fasc- infatuation. <laughs> infatuation. Is that with, a new word? Infascination. Oh, I'm so tired. It's so late. We have this weird thing about semi trucks where we have a, a like a romantic vision of them or something. Like think Smokey and the Bandit. Like mm-hmm. it's it's cool. It's I don't know what this is. It's a it's a U.S. thing. It's not cool. Just to be clear, semi trucks are not cool. Driving semi trucks are not cool. Um, Killing innocent people in their cars are not cool. I I hate semi trucks. It's, it's a stupid, stupid, stupid way to transport goods. My hometown has a fairly large, at least for this area, car show every year. A couple hundred cars. They have a semi truck class, and last year I think it was one of, if not the biggest individual class at the show. You're on your own, Michael. You like semi trucks? You like think the- it's a good way to Wait, transport goods? Are you goods? misconstruing that with me liking semi trucks? Because that's so far from true, it's not even funny. Oh, I thought your whole town was in on this, and that's like no. I think it's. Board. You buy uh, I would it. like to know that that class was added after my family was no longer affiliated with that <laughs> car club. He wants to make sure that separation is very clear. Oh god! Like almost to the year, we're out. It's in. Not nice. by not by complete and total, like on purpose, but it did happen that way. So anyway, we need to find an effective way to use electric semis because 
we will not get over it in the U.S. No, there's no way. We, we've we've built too much roadway at this point, and, and there's no way for us to go back to trains. It Walmart has a sense. concept, one that's like hybrid, and it has the largest single sheet of carbon fiber ever made. The trailer. How much is this hurting you inside, Robbie? <laughs> well, they're on a board now. <laughs> go on. I, I don't. I don't know anything more about it. I just remember reading it, and they said something about it being the largest single piece sheet of carbon fiber ever created. That seems like not a great way to manufacture anything. Like it's too big. Why would you, Why don't you just make little pieces, and make it modular? And... Stupid. Anyways. You could have as big or small of a truck as you want. Yeah, so you exactly. stack There's them up. a reason it's a concept. Yeah. I'm guessing that sounds like an expensive concept. I'm guessing that it was a, con- a conceptual and oh look at how cool this is. But when they actually make it, there are four four by eight foot sheets like everybody four else. Four foot by yeah. eight foot sheets of aluminum. Yeah, because there's no way to transport. The they giant won't sheet. use carbon fiber. Oh. Then they need a bigger semi to transport, transport their the bigger giant sheet. sheet. Yeah. Yep. 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 Or they'll go back to trains. Yeah. All right, we can move on from that. Um, and more sad news. Well, I guess we've touched on this a, bu- a bunch of times, but Viper is dying. It's This is 2017. It's over. Wah, wah, wah. And in response to that, Viper or Dodge is coming out with uh, five special Dodges or Vipers. So we have the... And they're all exactly the same. No, they're they different. different colors. They're, oh. They're and different one options. of them, I think one, maybe two, is not an ACR. Oh. See, I didn't realize before you couldn't get different colors of Viper. It's good now that as well, it, it's going out, you can have well, five they didn't different have colors. That, they didn't have that one of one thing where yeah, you could get one, a million different Vipers. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, so they did have different options for the yes. Viper before, but now there's only five options. But see, these are limited. Oh, wait, so were the other The ones. other ones were limited yes. as well. So they're going to take a car that they only sold, like, what, 700 of, and now they're going to add, like, um, the Yeah, that's Viper. the other thing that... These are not that limited of runs. They were all like 40 or 50 cars, aren't they? Yeah, the... So they're planning on selling them all next year, then. Yeah, the Viper GTS R, they're making 100 of them. The Viper Voodoo 2 Edition ACR, they're having 31 of. The Green Snake Skin Edition GTC, they're Robbie's building... Robbie's favorite. Two. Wrong. I, no. They're building Absolutely. 25 of them. No, wait a second. Is it then... real... It do, does it have real snake skin on it? No, of course no, it not. Looks... Does it have simulated snake skin? Yes. Yes. Hold on, hold on. In the paint. Burn it to the ground. <laughs> It's the so uh, it's the snake skin green is what they call it, and then it has a contrasting snake skin pattern in the SRT stripe. Nope. This is why nobody buys Vipers. You, you can't you, get you, a you, snake skin Corvette, I'll tell you that right you, now. You pair that with the glowing Viper logo. Oh, oh man. Yeah, for those that don't know, the tack the tack when you get Bright close green when too. you get close to red line starts glowing with what they call the quote striker, which is the, the <laughs> Viper emblem. It starts glowing in the background to tell you it's, to shift. It's like a shifter light. I think it's great. But it's the whole tack, and it glows at you. It's stupid. And the other thing is the 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 third brake light is the striker. I don't I'm know okay why that, that upsets you so much. It's, Who cares? It's so ricey. It's not that ricey. It's, not it's that ricey. Bad. It's just the it's just the lens and the lens is imprinted with the logo. It's not like it's laid out in LEDs to be the logo. It's so you've spent a hundred and thirty thousand dollars on your car. You want something that looks like it came out of Pep Boys for a Honda Civic. I don't agree with you at all because it's not a <laughs> stick on cover like you came from Honda's. Or it might like, as well be. You wow. at least you have snakeskin stick on stripes for your not He's a, a Honda. Real hater today, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he is negative. Anyway. Negative on such a positive episode. What else? Are there any, any other ones that they're going to put stupid stripes on or no, anything? No, the, the only one that the green one's the only one they have the snake skin stuff on. Everything else I think is. That was the only one that was not an ACR. Yeah, the Voodoo one is all black. They're all in commemorative of certain lap times. So, like the. Uh, oh, what's this one? The, the Just the, the regular ACR one is in response to the. Um, 128 lap at Mazda's Laguna Seca. Other than Apparently that, just... the last edition or the last gen Viper had a had a 33, which was its lap time, minute 33. Yep. And it had a 33 edition. Now this one has a 28 edition, and it they're making 28 did it a of minute them. and 28 seconds. So they actually do have a little bit of a theme thing going on. And there. Then they're then they're making a dealer special, which is the dealer edition ACR, which is only going to be sold through the one in Texas and the one in Illinois. They're making 33 of those. Largest Dodge dealerships in the country. Highest volume sales of Vipers. Sell the most Vipers. Yep. So the two dealers that sell the most Vipers, they get special ones. So they each get 
Well, I guess when now one gets more than the other one since there's 33. They, they sold five Vipers. Everybody else just sold like two or three. Neat for them. <laughs> yep. So I would definitely go with the uh, GTS one, though. I like the white with the blue. Yep. Uh, we agree? Yeah, we do. Which one do you get? The green one? All right, cool. Yep, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> and more sad news. Uh, Top Gear America is no more. I'm so mad about this, I'm, too. I'm convinced it's temporary. I hope it is. Uh, it, it appears that history canceled them. And according to Rutledge Wood and Tanner Faust's Facebook posts, they're not giving up on this yet. They want this to continue somewhere else. They just don't know where yet. And it seemed like the general consensus, everyone agreed that they were picking up steam. They it was were they getting were, they were, so oh, much better. No one really complained about them being bad in the beginning. They would they would complain because they it wasn't the original Top Gear. But like even now, like a couple years later, continuing, they've just gotten better and better and better. Michael excluded, who's hated it since day one and still hates it. No, I don't hate U.S. Top Gear. I just don't like Tanner Faust. I think he's as interesting as wet cardboard. Whoa! whoa. See, he's not <laughs> interesting. Have you heard him do any voiceover work? I'm not concerned about his voiceover. Yeah, work. So boring. I just want to see him drive. I don't care about his voiceover. That's voice why over. they had the Stig. Is the, the Stig is for driving. He doesn't speak. That's what Tanner should have been. Everyone bitch because oh, you guys have a Stig and a studio audience and a test track. Why don't you just call yourself Top Gear? From the UK. And so they branched out and they did something different. They just do what it is they do. They just have that show could have been called anything else and it wouldn't have been any different. It was I mean they I'm, dropped I'm not, the stick. I'm not hating on it. I don't I don't think it was a, a bad show. I just don't think that Tanner Faust was a good host. I don't agree at all. I think I, I think I like Rutledge it. Wood was good. I think Adam uh Ferrara, Ferrera, however yes, you say it, Ferreira. he was good too. I just He's boring. See, I th- I thought He's the all- most boring person on that show. Right, and I thought they all did well together, though. Like, they fed off each other. I, I- Those three do really well as as a group. But yeah, no, like, for in, sure. Like, in the spirit of the way television is going right now, I'm sure history didn't want to spend the money for it. Netflix is going to pick it up. I mean, they're spending money left and right. Amazon Prime might pick up. It, there's no way it's dead. I think they got... They ran, their contract ran out because history... As far as I know, it was not owned by the BBC. So no. that show was contracted to them. Mm-hmm. So I think that, that contract ran out, or they had a clause that said, if we want it back, or we decide that you don't get to host it anymore, we can take it back. Because I highly doubt, I really highly doubt, even though I don't like Tanner Faust, that that show was doing poorly. But it was. I think it was a good name, show. Name one other show on the History Channel. Monsters. Counting Cars. Which Is also- Monsters even on the History Channel still? Or yeah. is that dead? Oh, I'm sure it's, it's probably still a thing. Live. See, County Cars, I, I could not get into I thought it was... So bad. Yeah, I thought it was terrible. Okay, well, let's go down this road. It's better than... Gas Monkey Garage. Fast and Loud, I think is what it's called. Fast, yes. fast, fast and, and Loud. loud. I would, I would it's better than that. And not to completely oh, yeah. copy Jalopnik. I would say that they're equals in my eyes. I like The Count much more than I like Richard Rawlings. Yeah. The Count is more real. I don't he's like just that. a guy doing cars. He's, he likes car. He likes cars. That's he why he has that whole cars. warehouse full of cars that he yes, won't sell. I, which I, I, I won't about. disagree with any of that. I don't like a lot of the stuff he does. No, like, I think he has terrible taste. Yes. Oh, but I'd hang oh. out with him for a day. So, like, I would even argue that the Gas Monkey Garage stuff that they put out, as much as I hate a lot of the stuff they put out, like their their Slam GT40, I thought it looked great. Like his his Ferrari that he did looks great. They make better looking cars, but. From a distance, yeah. But I, I bet you that they're terrible when you get up close. Those to are like forty foot cars. Yes. And if I had to pick someone to hang out with, definitely be the count. I think the problem yeah, with counting cars is that it's again not to copy Jalopnik. It's that whole article that came out. What would have been like this week or the previous week? All that stuff's fabricated. So they're just trying to make money. This is a money making game for history or whoever has the show, and they're telling count. Maybe not necessarily Richard Rollins because I feel like it's in his blood by now. But they're telling him, be a douche. "You got to say this. <laughs> you got to pretend like you're driving around looking for cars, and then you see this car in air quotes, which is a car that we've placed there for you to find that we've already bought for you. And then you got to have this fake conversation. It's you know they're fabricating all of this because they know that it makes TV that people will watch that they can sell to advertisers. I bet you that he did that before the show, but it wasn't." As successful as they make it appear on the show. 
I'm sure that that guy oh, yeah, yeah. hopped in his street rod with his buddy and went cruising. And if they drove by a car lot and there was a, a Cuda sitting on there and it was a little rough and it was in the back row, they might have pulled in and said, hey, what do you want for that? Yeah. But it probably wasn't as successful as it is because it's on the show. The one gas monkey that I watched, Richard Rollins flew out to Wisconsin maybe or something like that and bitched about the weather the entire time. We get it. You're from L.A. Thanks. <laughs> but he offered somebody, it was for a, a Pantera, which is a car that I dearly love. He offered them like 2500 bucks for it, and they took it, supposedly. No, they didn't. What, what, what reality is that? That's not based on any reality that any of us live in. And if he talked to that person down to $2,500 and they took it because they didn't know any better, that feels wrong, too. I don't, uh, I don't feel he, like... I don't feel like the count would do that. There was a show where he claimed to have found numbers one and two of the Firebird. Like the 67 The Firebird? 67, numbers one and two. The very first ones, technically prototype cars. Okay. Both of those cars are in a museum. Oh, and he supposedly found, he found them. them in a, he found them in a barn in, in Timbuktu, you know, wherever, backwoods, nothing. Probably Michigan. I'm going to guess that they fabricated it to be in Michigan. Right. And like almost immediately after it came out, there were a whole bunch of people that wrote articles about, uh, wait a second, these cars are here. Yeah, liar. Those are those are just Joe, you know, normal 67 Firebirds that aren't anything special. That you fabricated like, a story about. Even, even the, uh, it even went, he was so wrong about it that even the options didn't match what numbers one and two are. So they just completely made it up. Yeah. Based wow. in no reality whatsoever. But 99.9% .9 of the general public would never know nor care enough to look into it. Nope. They could still sell that. It's still a cool idea that they could sell to people to watch, which means they can sell time to advertisers. You know who I like? Wayne Carini. You ever watch his show on Velocity? Can't even think of what it's called. No. But uh, that dude... He just buys and sells and, and does stuff with cars that you and I will never touch, like high-end Ferraris, wild, rare Porsches, and like he's always selling cars at uh, Pebble Beach and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think that he genuinely was the way he is now or on that show. He was exactly that way before the show, and I don't think that they do anything that's fabricated because he he just lives in that world. He lives in that world that none of us will ever understand. Well, and again, it's a it's a velocity show, which gets a so lot less exposure. So there's like 15 people that watch it on a regular basis. Yeah, so it's it's there's less of that pressure to, hey, we got to appeal to 4 million people. Otherwise, we're done, you know. That's where I that was where I instinctually thought Top Gear America may end up, but I think you're right, it's probably too small time. I really think and I, I, I honestly, I do hope that it comes back. I think it may actually go to BBC America, and maybe it won't. Do I you mean, think that they would replace regular Top Gear? At well, that point? that's where I get kind of on the fence. I wonder, I kind of wonder if they canceled it or pulled History's contract so that they could sell BBC Top Gear to the world under one brand. So I wonder if maybe that's where they were going because they've got Matt LeBlanc on there who's an American, obviously. So they're trying to appeal to a lot of people with that show. And so maybe they decided, well, one way we could maybe clear the market up a little bit would be to cancel that show and pull History's contract and then really push our BBC version to people in the U.S. Because we have an American. They can understand him. He's familiar looking. We could sell this. It's gotten way better. I don't know. But, you you know, so the worst case scenario is Robbie said, you know, those three guys go to Netflix, which would probably be a good place for them to go. They'll do something else. I mean, yeah. somebody else is going to give them money. Uh, you know, uh, the whole uh, top old Top Gear crew didn't get on Netflix. They couldn't get that to come together. So I'm sure Netflix is looking for right. that yeah. type of car they show. Gotta, they yeah. got to do something to rebuttal to the Grand Tour. Right. Yeah, because uh, Amazon Prime is doing pretty well, I think, with their TV shows. Yeah, they're absolutely. They're cutting into Netflix's market so that would make me really happy because i still haven't bit the bullet and bought amazon prime i already have netflix i've got it i'm, I'm ready i bought it preemptively nice i'm still trying to decide whether i'm gonna buy it or whether i'm gonna put that money into motor trend on demand 
Ooh, that's an interesting one. I kind of want to try Motor Trend on demand. To be they honest. keep pushing me with these three month trials, and and if you don't want it, you just cancel. And and I'm like, man, there's I a- want it, but. I think my my core problem with it is that I don't know that I have time to sit down. Katie all but refuses to watch car related shows with me. Yeah, it's not going to work then. She watched. She liked Top Gear because it was fun, and I think I could probably get her into Roadkill because it's fun. Anybody who's ever watched it, it's a great show. It's it's more of a down in the dirt Monster Garage Top type. Gear. Monster Garage. Well, that, was yeah, another, again, yes. that was another fun show. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Yeah, but it, 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 Roadkill's kind of like redneck Top Gear. Yeah, that's fair. There you go. But it, it, it's a lot of fun. It's fun. They have They're fun. They're hilarious. Yep. They're, they have a good time. And so I think I could probably sell her on that. But, you know, I'm not going to... She's not going to sit there on, and watch Lamar coverage with no, me or Motor anything Trend like on that. Demand is definitely going to be more gearhead typed content it's not going to be entertainment content for the masses so yeah that's going to be a hard sell maybe that's where they'll end up motor train on demand maybe oh you know who's back uh i always screw up his name because of roadkill always mixed up his name <laughs> carlos La- lagos no that can't be right there's not two os's in his name car no log carlos lagos they- i think they called him larlos cargo on the show and that's how I know him from now on. It screws me <laughs> up. But he was on, do you remember he was on Matt Farah's podcast? Yeah, he was. Um, and he was talking about how he was unemployed because he went to Edmonds in a really weird... Yeah, and he was like, I don't like so this good. place. I'm out. It, was, it was weird because he built that S, I think it was an S13 that was LS swapped. They did the uh, the LS3 crate motor that's emissions legal in 50 states because they're in California. So they did that swap on that car. And he was doing all this stuff and they were tweaking it and they were putting $4,000 wheels on it and then he quit. And obviously, you don't get to take the car with you when you leave. So he went to Edmonds, and he was there for a year, maybe. He reviewed a Viper and did a bunch of other stuff that nobody knows about. And all of a sudden, now he's back. So I like him. Largos Carlos, or whatever his name is. He's good, even if he, have, even if he has a confusing name. I can't imagine any of a more radical change while still staying in the automotive journalism world, going from Motor Trend, motor trend. to... Edmonds, where you get no video content and you have to write normal reviews. Yeah, you, you review Priuses and Toyota Corollas. I think they're like, hey, we'll make you editor-in-chief. Give you a fancy title and a big pay raise, you know. And So that was appealing. And then he got there and went, this is soul-suckingly terrible. I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> so Guess just, what? I'll take my, my pay cut going back. I'm going back. I want my you. S13 swapped, LS swapped car back. Thanks. Is that it, Robbie? That's all I got. Okay. I'm tired. I'm going to bed. Yeah, let's wrap this up. Let's wrap this up with some social media shout outs. Uh, so we've got, uh, you can find us at 10 Tense Podcast on Facebook and on Twitter at the number 10 Tense Podcast. Uh, you can find us on Instagram and Car Throttle as well as just 10 Tense Podcast. 10 Tense Podcast.com, where Adam's doing his, uh, you're basically doing podcast features on there where you've got all the pictures. Every single episode we've ever done has a little little blurb and uh they're getting more and more detailed as i go so uh i would really love it if somebody just went on there and gave me a little comment maybe maybe one of these maybe this week had a news article that really tickled your fancy go on there tell us about it please. also i would like to remind everybody to uh please give us a five-star review and write us uh actually write us a review on itunes uh feel free to call robbie um any bad name that you can think of and uh, make up your own no, nicknames. No, like call Rob's Michael a bad name. Yeah. Michael doesn't have it. He has no nicknames. Let's leave <laughs> Robbie out of this. Yeah, no. I've got a nickname. Robbie's got a few nicknames. nicknames. We need something for you, Michael. Fine. People can go on iTunes, and I dare you to give me a uh, nickname of some kind. Um, I don't know. Think of something. Be creative, though. Don't don't just call me ass face because that's really boring. <laughs> My life might be complete if somebody gives me like a really nasty nickname. On iTunes. My life will be complete for sure. But it has to be five star, and the rest of the review has to be like, the show is great, but just so you know, we're trying to start this nickname, and here it is. Bam. So we got a new one this week. Should we should we use his uh, his line to close out our show tonight? I don't know if memorized yet, but yeah. I know what it is. Perfect. You want Go me to it. do it? Say it. Are we done? Yeah, we're is done. Is this over? This is over. All right. Keep the annex up and the pedal down. Catch you guys podcast. next week. <laughs> Bye. Bye.